Hello, ladies and gentle soars. Welcome to the long-awaited third episode of Orbis Pagona, my little seed world project inspired by Alien Evolution's Project Apollo. I've seen in the comments that you guys have been asking for more of this series, and I am happy to oblige. To recap, the events of the series take place after a generational ship of scientists whose original mission was to terraform a desert planet to make it habitable for humans, seed the world with various species of plant, insects, fish, fungi, etc., and then leave the planet to head back for Earth to presumably bring back the first human colonists. However, as they were terraforming the planet, many of the scientists' pet bearded dragons escaped the vessel and began to spread across the desert planet rapidly as the climate was pretty much perfect for them. Because I'm making this stuff up as I go, I'm gonna fill a little story gap here. The scientists who initially came to terraform the planet were a vanguard for a second ship that would bring the first human colonists, as well as larger animals that could not fit on the first ship. However, that ship never came, for reasons unknown to us as interdimensional observers. So what species exactly did the scientists bring with them? Well, that would be a very long list to make, so I'm just gonna list a few here. Those are just a handful that I'm going to use for reference for Spec Evo going forward. You can fill in the gaps with your imagination, but as a general rule of thumb, the smallmouth bass was the largest species aboard the terraforming vessel, and there are no other reptiles, birds, or mammals. There are not going to be any other animals that are added randomly. What we got is what we got. In the last episode, we left off at the beginning of the Phytonian period where we see an explosion of plant life, as well as an ongoing diversification of bearded dragons into different niches. But what about the other species on Orbis Pagona? The Phytonian explosion of course resulted in larger amounts of oxygen in the atmosphere, whereas in the Vitacine the oxygen levels were around 18%, Phytonian levels are upwards of 30%. So we see maybe a 10-15% to increase in size of many invertebrate species around the planet though they are still held back by things like predation. But for two species in particular, the predation factor does not apply, the first of which are dragonflies. Because there are not yet any flying vertebrates on Orbis Pagona, some dragonflies reach sizes of just under a foot with a two-foot wingspan, coming very close to the size of their Carboniferous ancestors on Earth like the Meganeura. They feed on a variety of other insects such as beetles, spiders, grasshoppers, moths, etc. Really, there's not much different about them other than their size. However, there is a new addition to their diet, that being young bearded dragons. These larger dragonflies can easily take down juvenile beardies up to six months, depending on the species, making life for the Pagonas on Orbis Pagona continuously harder as time goes on. For many millions of years going forward into the Phytonian, it is these dragonflies that dominate the airborne ecosystems, until something larger comes along, of course. I have dubbed them the Juva Draconis Ochizor, which roughly means the Young Dragon Killer, or we'll just call them the Dragon Hawk for short. The second insect that has benefited from an increased amount of oxygen and lack of predation is Rhinoceros beetles, one of the many species introduced upon terraforming the planet. On top of being a great food source for the animals that would have been brought with the colony ship, they also eat a lot of fruit and are vital to spreading the seeds of those fruits here on Earth. They were brought to near extinction during the Vitocene, like many other species, but we see a particularly large population of them on one island within the newly formed freshwater seas that emerge in the Phytonian. Rather than forming volcanically, this island is simply a former plateau of higher elevation than the surrounding landscapes. As rising sea levels absorbed the area around it, the rhinoceros beetles found themselves on an island with not much competition and no predation from bearded dragons. This created an environment that, similar to the dragons in the Vitacene, got crowded quickly. Within three to four generations, fruit on this island became scarce, forcing them to find alternative sources of food, the most abundant of which was leaves and grass. With zero competition or predators, these beetles grew nearly three times their original size, but only on their island home. Rhinoceros beetles lay their eggs in decaying logs, and as the island populated, more beetles lay their eggs on decaying logs closer to the shore. And when a large storm swept over the island, a piece of driftwood carrying beetle eggs and larvae found its way to the shores of the mainland. These beetle larvae would pupate into adults and find themselves in a land that is infinitely abundant in grass and leaves in comparison to their island home. Enter the Vacastus coleopteris, 
a massive rhinoceros beetle that inhabits the plains and forest of Orpus Pagona. Their name can roughly be translated to the Royal Cow Beetle. The cow beetles can be compared in size to Galapagos tortoises, reaching a length of 4 feet or 1.2 meters, and a height of 3 feet or just under a meter, weighing just under 400 pounds or 180 kilograms. Now, before we get into their lifestyle, of course these guys are pretty much impossible in terms of how we understand the size limits of insects. Conventionally, the insects cannot get this big because their respiratory and circulatory systems are not like those of vertebrates, as well as the limitations of their exoskeletons. I'm not going to go into incredible detail, again because I'm not a scientist and I make these videos for entertainment, cannot stress that enough, but I'll try to make it make a little bit of sense. The cow beetle has evolved more robust circulatory and respiratory systems that allow them to more efficiently diffuse oxygen from the atmosphere around them along with strong muscles that force more air in, almost like a turbocharger for a car. Their exoskeletons are almost 2.5 inches thick with a layered honeycomb structure in order to compensate for their size, drastically increasing their weight and decreasing their mobility. To keep up with this size, these guys are constantly eating pretty much every waking moment of their lives. They've evolved mouths that are much more similar to that of grasshoppers to better suit a diet of primarily grass. When feeding, these guys will leave a trail of much shorter grass behind them, almost like a lawnmower just came through. This is because they only eat down to just above the root of the grass so that they can come back to the same grass they ate in a few weeks time and eat it again, kind of like sheep or capybaras. They scuttle across the fields of grass at a grand speed of just half a mile per hour, giving themselves plenty of time to eat as much grass as they can. They also feed on some brush very low to the ground, but more than 90% of their diet is grass. Rising temperatures have a direct impact on insect metabolism, so to mitigate this to some degree, the cow beetles have a pearly white exoskeleton to absorb less heat from the sun, and will spend a lot of time in shadier areas during the hottest of days. Of course, these guys have entirely lost their ability to fly, not only because they're simply too heavy, but because their wings and wing sheaths have fused into one carapace. The cow beetles live in decently large groups consisting of one male and many other females. Much like their ancestors, males are very aggressive towards one another and will use their horns to wrestle each other for mating rights. These wrestling matches will typically be resolved when the losing beetle is either flipped over or their horn is broken. These groups of cow beetles, called harems, will usually have no more than 10 females. And occasionally, because males with broken horns can't grow them back, these harems will also include subordinate males with broken horns. As it stands in our current time frame, the early Phytonian, adult cow beetles have no predators and no competition, and are quickly spreading across the planet, much like the Neuchosaurus. Neuchosaurus and cow beetles have a somewhat peaceful relationship and can be often found feeding in the same areas and moving with each other. These joint herds are called congregations. The two species will not typically fight, though cases where Neuchosaurus get in the way of cow beetle jousts are not totally uncommon. So, we see that invertebrates on land are doing quite well, but how about invertebrates in the water? One of the most important species to be introduced on Orbis Pagona is crayfish, specifically the European crayfish. You see, crayfish are one of the most important species in their respective food chains, consuming algae, water weeds, and other aquatic animals. In turn, they themselves feed hundreds of different animals. On Orbis Vigona, many species of fish, large freshwater crabs, as well as Stagnosaurus, depend on crayfish as a substantial part of their diet, making them a keystone species on Orbis Vigona, just like they were on Earth. But, perhaps in this new world, the crayfish may not be so complacent in this role as a keystone species. Crayfish, lobsters, and other decapods like them have a unique adaptation that allows them to swim backwards rapidly in a sort of snapping motion using their unique tails. This is more so used as a quick means of escape rather than a regular form of locomotion. For that, they use their walking legs as well as their swimmerettes. But what if the crayfish adapted the ability to swim forward using their tails? However unlikely this may be, some crayfish begin to form the habit of only partly using their tails to swim forward, to assist the movement of their swimmerettes. This gives them a mild boost of speed that allows them to actually pursue the fish swimming in the waters above them, rather than being relegated to the sea floor. Over generations, the ability to use their tail in a fashion similar to that of cetaceans is further expanded upon. They are now on par with the speed of many fish around them, which lets some of the crayfish eat much more protein and calories than they'd be able to before, which allows them to grow much larger, along with the increased oxygen content of the water 
as a result of the Phytonian explosion. Enter Venasticus Pateri, whose name means the forefather of hunting crayfish, or for short, just the pursuit crayfish. These guys reach a length of 2 feet or 60 centimeters and usually weigh around 30 pounds or 14 kilograms, which puts them at a size not too dissimilar from the largest of lobsters and crayfish on Earth. They can swim about 10 miles per hour or 16 kilometers per hour with a burst speed of up to 25 miles per hour or 40 kilometers per hour. They eat pretty much all the same things as other crayfish, with the addition of much larger fish, young Stagnosaurus, their smaller ancestors, and oftentimes each other. They hunt by, of course, pursuing fish that are not too much faster than them. During this pursuit, they will fold their arms and legs backwards and use their powerful tails to propel themselves forward, as well as use their fan-shaped swimmerettes to help with quick turns. When they are close enough to their prey item, they will bring their claws forward, snatch it, and bring it to the seafloor to begin feasting. These guys are not quite yet at the top of the food chain, though. They still have the Megamouth Bass to worry about, who often grow to sizes that are still capable of swallowing them whole even after they've reached full maturity, controlling their population greatly, for now. Now, it seems some of these newly adapted species on Orbis Pagona are getting out of control. Neutrosaurus, the Cow Beetle, Dragon Hawks, Megamouth Bass… Surely, the Bearded Dragons are gonna have to up the ante pretty soon. So. Join me in the next episode where we will go back to our old friends from episode 1 and see how they have evolved to take down some of these newly emerged species. Thank you guys so much for watching. Big thank you to our patrons and channel members, some of which include Galactic Narwhal, Lex Gunn, Tyler Sparks, Ryan Fort 14, Green Turret, Mike Yost. If you enjoyed this episode, leave a like and a comment, subscribe, and perhaps share it with your friends. If you enjoy the channel as a whole, consider joining the Discord where you can talk to me and some other folks. If you feel like supporting the channel, become a patron or a channel member for some unique rewards such as seeing videos up to three days before they've uploaded to YouTube, joining our modded Minecraft server, an exclusive patron chat in the Discord channel, and many more. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you next time.